Good evening. I'm delighted to invite you to the first roundtable discussion on the heritage co-organized by the Center for Heritage and the Center for Critical International Law. Uh, the Center for Heritage is an interdisciplinary center which is based at Kent here and brings together researchers who contribute to the identification, preservation, and better understanding of heritage to address political, economic, social, and educational issues and threats. Um, it spans, the center spans all disciplines to create a space of collaboration and to develop new models and tools of, um, regarding heritage and its protection. The Center for Critical International Law at Kent also aims to foster critical approaches to the field of international law and other areas of law that touch upon global legal problems through promoting collaboration and exchange at KLS and within the broader scholarly community. Both centers have decided to collaborate to develop a program of events that further a critical approach and test the boundaries of their respective disciplines. And this is exactly what we're going to do here tonight. The first roundtable is today on the, themes of, on the theme of heritage and belonging with a focus on Notre Dame de Paris. The roundtable will host four speakers from different disciplines. We will discuss these questions and set them in the wider context of their research or practice. I'm sorry to say that uh, Jonathan Deming, who should have come today, uh, cannot be present this evening and he sends his apologies. Many questions were raised after the fire that severely damaged um, Notre Dame de Paris in April 2019. Yet these questions are not specific to Notre Dame and echo some of the issues encountered by many heritage sites internationally and locally. So our four speakers here will mention and discuss some of these issues. I want to thank them for agreeing to be here tonight and agreeing to be provocative. So, Emily, I'm just going to introduce briefly our four speakers before giving the floor to um, Emily, our first speaker. So, Emily will describe, Emily Gary will talk about when heritage becomes a symbol of belonging to a culture or place. It was amazing when the fire happened. I mean, I was in France at the time, it was on TV for 24 hours nonstop. And suddenly, all the people in the street love Notre Dame de Paris. It was unbelievable. I never thought that there was such a love for this old pile of bricks. And there was also no understanding, or I'm sure, no sure there was much knowledge about how much um, relics, how many relics, and what was the importance of these relics in the cathedral as well. But here it was. It was like this unifying moment of grief shared by most French people in France or abroad. Um, then Timothy, Britain, Kathleen will talk about the impact of restoration because when he mentioned all buildings are artificial creations and where there are no ethical rules about what they should look like, um, what or how should Notre Dame be restored? And there are obviously already being several discussions and tensions in France as to what should be done and what should happen. Um, Karen Jones will then talk and be provocative about the opposition between the natural and the cultural. The charpente, the uh, roof timber of Notre Dame was very often described as the forest of Notre Dame because it took a whole forest to build this timber roof. So what should happen to that? Should the whole forest be cut down in order to protect this heritage? What should be protected more, the cultural or the natural heritage? So we'll have these discussions. And finally, we'll have um, Andrew Edwards from the Cathedral of Canterbury, who will talk about the role of philanthropy, because as well, when the cathedral uh, was burned and after it was burned, there was a crowdfunding was set up by a few people. Uh, it started spontaneously. And I think almost a million euro was raised in 10 or 15 days after the fire broke down and the two most billionaires, uh, Pino and, um, you know, from one's from LVMH and the other one is um, whatever Pino thing, Pino et François Arnaud, um, raised 100, promised 100 million and the other 200 million uh, to protect the cathedral. So 
the question was, but why not give all this money to people who are dying of hunger, to people who are suffering from war, or to other kind of people? So there was this opposition between the cultural and the human who should prevail. So we are going to have those discussions for each speaker. We'll have approximately 10, 15 minutes to present their, their topic, and then we will have questions at the end. So if you do have questions, could, they please, could you please write them down? And we'll have like a roundtable discussion at the end of those presentations. And this will be followed by drinks. We've got some nice red and white wine as well. And then they're cutting drinks. <laughs> so our first speaker is um, Emily Gary, who is a senior lecturer in medieval European history. Um, I'm going to introduce her briefly first. Um, she moved to the UK from the US a few years ago. She completed her PhD and after that had a three-year junior research fellowship fellow, sorry, junior research fellowship at Merton College, the University of Oxford. Um, her research interest is mainly to examine the relationship between religious devotion and artistic representation in the Middle Ages. And her research takes an interdisciplinary and inclusive approach to visual, material, and ceremonial culture, as well as historical, political, and liturgical source material. She's worked a lot on French cathedrals, so Notre Dame de Paris is one. I think Chartres is another one, and she's written widely and broadly on the topic. And she's going to discuss so heritage and belonging and the importance of heritage. You have here one of the, uh, I found this picture on the, uh, website is the tunic of Saint Louis, so Louis the Ninth, which was, I bet not many people knew, hosted in Notre Dame de Paris, and luckily it did was not burned. It's still safe. So, Emily, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Sophie, for organizing this fantastic event. And um, it's quite a somber topic to talk about the destruction of Notre Dame de Cathedral in Paris. And for any of us who live or work in Paris, as Sophie was saying, it really is a symbol of belonging. Even if you're a visitor for one fine afternoon, it remains a totem of great importance. And what I want to do with my sort of uh, part and participation in this roundtable is give you a brief but um, hopefully meaningful sense of the long history of this site. Because um, one thing that strikes me as a Gothic art historian, Gothic architectural historian, is um, this is not the worst chapter in the cathedral's very long and distinguished history. Um, equally, uh, it has transformed so much over the years. And for those of you who've studied your late antique history, you'll know that the Ile de la Cité is the site of the first sort of um, tribe of named people in the region who are the Parisi. And the name of this town in the Roman world was Lutetia. Uh, but for medieval Christians, um, they believed first of all that they were the direct descendants of Trojans, which is very cool. And they also believed that um, the first cathedral on the site was effectively founded by the bloodshed of their first martyr, uh, whose name was Saint Denis. And perhaps those of you have visited the wonderful Basilique of uh, Saint-Denis, a little to the north of Paris. And I'm showing you here one of my favorite manuscripts in the world, The Life of Saint Denis. Really, it's about his death. But um, it tells the story of how a man who was a convert of the Apostle Paul went to the Gallic region and found Paris to be a new paradise and brought the Christian mission to those people. Um, this story is beautifully represented here in this royal manuscript where you also see the frames representing the medieval city of Paris. So it's quite a wonderful object for its own reflection of 14th century history. Here you see, for example, the manuscript being given to the French king at the time, but also it tells a, the kind of mythic story of the, uh, the French identity, its Christian identity really taking form in the Middle Ages. Now, Dennis was famously meant to have been beheaded on Montmartre, the mountain of the martyr, of course, but he caught his head and walked for another few miles to the location of Saint-Denis. Um, but he was the one who first preached from the location of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, or so we're told. We can use manuscripts to get a sense of what the cathedral looked like in the Middle Ages, for example, in this wonderful illumination in the so-called Très Riches Heures from the early 15th century. And I'm showing you it just there on the horizon next to the wonderful Saint-Chapelle. 
But what does the evidence actually tell us? Well, the current site of the cathedral is on top of at least four to five previous major sites. And the earliest of which we have concrete archeological information is that of a Roman basilica, which was probably transformed into a Christian site about 20, 30 years after the Council of Nicaea. We give it a date of about 360. And of course, in this period, you don't turn a temple into a church. You turn a secular building like a basilica into a space for worship. And by the early 6th century, that had been sort of refurbished and converted. Then again, we have evidence in the form of mosaics and wonderful Carol um, Corinthian capitals that date from a Carolingian period after Charlemagne, around 845. And finally, we have lots of evidence for Romanesque rebuilding from around the start of the 12th century. But the moment I'm most interested in is the so-called Gothic project. And that's where the cathedral you see today really started to take its magnificent form. And it was consecrated, or rather the first sort of stone, the foundation stone was laid on the 25th of April in 1163. This was overseen by Bishop Oud de Sully in the presence of King Louis VII and Pope Alexander III. And for those of you who know your own Canterbury Cathedral history, it was Pope Alexander III that befriended Becket, welcomed him to France in exile, and eventually canonized him, St. Thomas Becket, and that was in 1173. So this world overlaps with our own here in Kent. Um, I'm showing you a, a very complicated slide, but very briefly, I just want to say that there's a lot of amazing Gothic experimentation happening at this site. So what you're looking at is this interest in what was happening at Abbot Suje Saint-Denis, which is said to be the earliest Gothic monument, where you have a dramatic new emphasis on height and light. And the doors that bring you into the cathedral become a system of teaching. And then to make the cathedral taller and brighter and stronger, they start to bring in what we call, it's a great term that always makes my students laugh, flying buttresses. These wonderful sort of tarantula arms that reach across and spread the weight down across these vertical shafts. Another kind of design feature I want to highlight personally before I take you through some nice pictures is the so-called rayonant facelift. Now, around the year 1240, there's this new interest instead of sort of Icarus flying to the sun with the Gothic style, where you're getting taller and taller and taller, there's this renewed fascination with delicacy and preciousness. So all those little kind of wonderful surface effects that you see on the west facade of Notre Dame that I'll show you in a moment belong to this later period in the 13th century, as do the transept extension, that's the widening of the arms on either side, as well as the kind of belt of so-called lateral chapels. And I'm talking about, if you follow my cursor here, these little insertions that go all the way around the choir and the apse. Now those post-date the year 1274, because in 1274, a bunch of prelates and clerics got together at the Second Council of Lyon and confirmed the existence of purgatory. And what purgatory does is it gives you more time to kind of pray your way out of pain. So all these new chapels become inserted into the space to allow more people to pray for the salvation of their souls. So the building is always reactive, always experimental and, and inventive. The last thing I should highlight too is this aspect of cultural revolution. Because around the year 1200, it's where you're also getting the invention of something that we call polyphony. Uh, multi-singing sacred music, um, where the choir here, these are actually the brightest, most kind of groundbreaking musicians we know of in medieval Europe, and they're all working on site. Uh, Leonin, uh, Perrotin, some of the most famous musicians of the 13th century are designing all of their music for this community and for this space. So what do I mean by flying buttresses? I'm showing you something that I'm sure Tim will allude to, which are these drawings done by Violet Le Duc before he went to work on restoring the space and writing his kind of dictionnaire raisonné. But those are the kind of flying buttresses, the really magnificent things. And I'm showing you here on the right Violet Le Duc's kind of bird's eye view plan of what the cathedral's footprint looks like. And this is where the kind of bishop would have had his sort of important meetings and things like this. Now. The flying buttresses remain strong despite the fire, and on the right, uh, I'm showing you a lovely image of what I think is also so interesting about the interior of Notre Dame in terms of its identity, because you have this kind of, we call this an elevation. That's the arcade. This is the gallery or triforium, and then this is the clerestory. It's a kind of very clear tripartite system. And you have this kind of sacred 
number three going through everything. And it's a very clean, clear vision of how to control the space. And the vaults above have a lovely name. These are sex partite vaults, which means there are six parts to them. But they're a massive leap forward from the kind of quadripartite vault that you had in an earlier system. Um, here are some of my MEM students walking around in the Triforium from a couple of years ago, marveling at its sort of interior shape and scope. And again, the point is, is to bring as much light in by reducing what the walls have to do to lift up the space, so replacing stone with glass. Now, the, the other thing I want to bring your attention ter to in terms of identity is the West Portal Sculptural Program. And this all dates to around the year 1200. And these aren't just doors, they're encyclopedias. They're spaces to teach. Because in addition to being the place where sort of medieval music is really developing, um, we're just down the road from the University of Paris where in fact the doyenne d'Eglise de Paris, the kind of the number one sort of student or scholar would always go on for about 150 years to become the dean here at Notre Dame. So Notre Dame and the university had a very close relationship and these doors are places where you can see salvation in the stories they tell. So at the very center, I wanna zoom in really quickly here on what the sculptural program tells us about the identity and heritage of this site. At the very center, that kind of pointy shape, we call that a tympanum. And in that tympanum, we have Christ raising both of his hands, coming back at the last judgment. And this all comes from Matthew chapter 25, the picture of the Son of Man coming back to judge, to take the blessed to his right up to heaven, and to curse the damned down to hell. And it's the sheep and the goats, as it were. Now, something that's always made me sort of so happy to teach my students this in Paris is, the sculpture you see in situ at Notre Dame, for the most part, um, reflects 19th century sort of rebuilding, uh, redesign efforts. But a lot of the original elements are still in the city of Paris, kept in the Musée de Cluny. So you can see the heads that used to be the heads of the apostles and the Old Testament kings that were ripped off in the revolution. And you can also see the vestiges of the lintel, which is the horizontal beam that supports the tympanum. And here at the very center of the most important door in all of medieval Paris, you see a very joyous scene. It's an image of the resurrection at the end of time. And the people who appear in that lintel were medieval Parisians. So you do have some bishops and fancy ladies with wimples, but you also have normal people. And for example, Paris in the 13th century, when this is being designed, was a huge capital for ivory trade. And you have an African man here coming back to life, looking very happy about it. So you again, you have this kind of mise-en-scene with the real Paris reflected in the design of their aspirations for the future. And on that note, I think I want to sort of slowly close down on a sad but hopefully uplifting idea about heritage, which is the thing that broke my heart the most was the fear of losing those rose windows. These are so special. They're so wonderful. They show the last judgment. And um, there on the left is my image of the crossing uh, before and after the fire. And these rose windows really maximize the impact of light in the space, and they tell a dramatic story about the end of time, synthesizing salvation through the, the protection of the Virgin Mary. There's over 8,000 tesserae of 13th century glass that still survive, thank goodness, in that space. And these rose windows don't even captivate us now. They captivated people in the Middle Ages, too. So I wanted to close with this idea of what seeing Notre Dame felt like for a 14th century Parisian. Um, he was a scholar at the University of Paris. His name was Jean de Jandon, and he wrote this Tractatus de Laudibus Parisius, or um, a treatise in praise of Paris, in 1323, saying, that most glorious church of the most glorious virgin, Virgin Mary, mother of God, deservedly shines out like the sun among stars. And although some speakers by their own free judgment, because they are only able to see a few things easily, may say that some other is more beautiful, I believe, however, respectfully, that if they attend more diligently to the whole and the parts, they will quickly retract this opinion. Where indeed, I ask, where would they find two towers of such magnificence and perfection, so high, so large, so strong, clothed round about with such multitude varieties of ornaments? Where, I ask, would they find such a multi-partite arrangement of so many lateral vaults above and below? 
Where, I ask, would they find such light-filled amenities as the many surrounding chapels? Furthermore, let them tell me in what church I may finally see such a large cross of which one arm separates the choir from the nave. Finally, and here's my favorite part, finally, I would willingly learn where there are two such circles situated opposite each other in a straight line, which on account of their appearances are given the name of the fourth vowel O. He's referring here, of course, to the rose windows, and in the Latin it all rhymes so that you don't actually say O, oh, but you do this, the noise with your mouth, it's amazing. <laughs> Among which smaller orbs and circles with wondrous artifice, so that some arrange circularly, others angularly, surround windows ruddy with precious colors and beautiful with the most subtle figures of the pictures. In fact, I believe that this church offers the carefully discerning such cause for admiration that its inspection can scarcely sate the soul. So even though those words were ushered by someone who worked at a university in the 14th century, for me, they remain true today. So I think what's so special about studying, teaching, and hoping saving Notre Dame de, de Paris is the fact that it does make anyone who loves it feel like they belong there. So I think I'll close on that rather kind of sad note, but thank you. to introduce you first, okay, if I can say a few words. It's actually um, Tim, he's an architect. Um, he's been writing about architectural history for many years, both for general readership and for those with a particular interest in the revolutionary changes in architectural thinking in early 19th century England. So that's wonderful because Tim will be able to give us and talk to us a little bit more about the restoration of of Notre Dame in particular regarding the spire which was added by Violet Le Duc. And we see in France, there's, this is an article from November 14, 2019, so quite recent. The person who is in charge of the restoration is a general, so an army man. Um, and there has been some tension between the architect and the general. In, in one of the stations, the general has literally, apparently, I, I quote, um, has caused astonishment by publicly telling the cathedral's chief archi architect to, quote, shut his mouth, unquote. Um, in French, il a, il a dit, in French, fermer sa gueule. It's very vulgar, <laughs> actually. But that just shows the tension as to what should be done about the cathedral. So, Tim, Welcome and thank you. I think you was left hand side. This one. That's it. Yes. Well, I thought actually that what I would do is pick up a phrase of Sophie's when she introduced it, which is a pile of old bricks. Uh, we've got a pile of new bricks here, as I'll um, point out to you in a moment. And what I'm going to do is not talk about the 19th century history of Notre Dame. I'm going to give you a kind of parable, uh, a parallel story, which picks out in English terms what the problems are when dealing with the new uh, and with the old. Now, we know where this is. I've chosen this because it's a sort of English equivalent to Notre Dame in, in some senses, in terms of its importance to the capital. And if you, if you look up in uh, any guidebook or any tourist guide or any of the rest of it, it will tell you that this is a group of houses that's built in the early 18th century. They usually say the 1720s. One of the things I've done regularly uh, over the years is ask my 19th century architecture students which is older, Downing Street or me? And only one person has ever given the correct example, the correct answer, which is exactly the same, because Downing Street was built between 1958 uh, and 1963, and very little of what you see is actually part of, uh, of pa a part of uh, its historic appearance. That's what it looked like before 1958. And the first thing to say about it is that it's not very good, is it? It doesn't look very attractive. Uh, it looks like what it is, which is a row of uh, cheap Georgian slums, uh, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, left to chance in the way in which they've developed, in fairly bad condition. Uh, the building at the end is the, is the kind of stump of a building that had, had burnt out some time uh, before. 
Uh, and uh, what's worth saying here, I think, first of all, is that there's a comparison that you should make here, which is also a fairly direct one with Notre Dame as it happens, and that is that all of England's medieval churches, well, to be exact, it's thought 96% uh, of England's medieval churches were remodeled in the 19th century, in most cases beyond recognition. What you see today are a set of Victorian buildings, uh, which also, of course, provide with them a, a clear picture, a kind of set of instructions about what it is that, building, that churches should look like. Certainly, nobody ever knew that before. So of those, if you find one of the remaining 4%, there's a comic one called St. Clement's in Cambridge, uh, for example. It's actually an extreme rarity. And it was commented on by Pugin and by early Gothic revivalists in England that, in fact, the situation, the terrible condition that most um, churches uh, were in in England was actually probably better than, the, than the, the situation that they were in in France, where revolution had, in many cases, damaged them even worse than the Reformation had damaged them in England. Uh, here's a little picture about the borderline between the old and the new. That's Raymond Erith. He's the person who designed Downing Street, uh, standing, as you can see, outside the door of number 10. So there's a kind of boundary uh, between the old and the new. If you've wondered why Downing Street is that funny shape, it's because it was originally a kind of long, narrow square with grass uh, in the middle. So the houses continued round on all three sides, and they were there until the government buildings went up on the other side of the road. So the point I'm addressing here, really, is where did this distinction come from, this idea come from, that there is a distinction between the old and the new that is so important in all the discussions about the age of buildings? And the answer is that it came from the same place that most modernist dogma in architectural history came from, and that's the propagandists of the Gothic Revival. One of the most interesting discoveries for me was to find that nearly all the statements of dogma of the modern movement, which hung on an awfully long time, and much longer than the Gothic Revival ones did, they came, in fact, from the the slightly crazy young men with the mad staring eyes of the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, what's often described as the most successful undergraduate society of all time, the Ecclesiological Society, uh, which set about, very young people in their mid-twenties, some of them, uh, set about changing the appearance of churches uh, across the country. And they were full of outrage, and they were full of yes and no, basically. Uh, and they invented the idea, which the modernists took up with great satisfaction, that if something isn't completely perfect, then it is some kind of enemy that must be destroyed. So therefore you get, for example, accounts of the ecclesiologists going off on their tours around the countryside to see new Gothic churches. And if some unfortunate architect doing their best hadn't got it quite right in a new church or in a remodeled church, then instead of saying, we regret that this could have been better, they say, we have never seen such an outrageous scandal in our lives as this disgusting monstrosity that this, that, that, that this charlatan has designed for us. The great fight is going on between uh, the pure and the impure, the one true way of doing anything, and the rest is this, is this sort of moral outrage. Uh, and the success of this very unhistorical and unvisual message has coloured the way in which we see complicated buildings, such as our own churches in Notre Dame, to this very day. It's very difficult for most people when they come across buildings, mixed buildings of this kind, uh, to see it as something of quality rather than to see it as something that is compromised or has to be explained away in some way or another. Now, the Gothic Revival produced some of the finest buildings in England, but its obsession about purity and unity seems to me to have been a false move. Here's a view. Now, the quality of the photographs now will suddenly improve enormously because these were taken by taken for me by Robin Forster. Uh, here's a view which may well be familiar to you if, you've, if, if you know West Kent well. This is Leicester Square outside Penshurst, and it was designed by the architect George Devey when Pugin was still alive. 1848, 1849, 1850, these were going up. Now, here is the revolutionary thing uh, that Devey did here. You cannot tell what is old, what is new, and what is remodeled without looking really closely at it, and even then you can't. He made very few mistakes. He knew the language of old buildings really well. Now, of course, from time immemorial, Fashionable, successful, uh, uh, gifted architects had remodeled old cottages and done them up. There's nothing new about that part of it. The point, the thing that DV was doing, which was completely unknown beforehand, was that you couldn't tell what was new and what was old at all. It, he wasn't making a statement about himself 
other than by mixing these two things together. This is an extraordinary innovation, and it had much more impact on later Victorian, uh, and on Edwardian architecture in particular, than one might generally have thought. So now I want to talk about a building which makes a, connect uh, makes a connection between this idea of the fact that a building can very often be a mixture of old and new without any compromise to either side, and our own dear Canterbury Cathedral, because this, this house was built, designed for his own family by W.D. Caro, who was, of course, the surveyor to the fabric at the beginning of the 20th century uh, in, uh, at Canterbury. Now, this house is really quite an extraordinary thing. It may be familiar to you. Does it look vaguely familiar to anybody? Who's, be, who's watching television a year and a half ago? This uh, was used rather brilliantly, I think, as the setting for the television adaptation of Howard's End, uh, which I think was just over a year ago. The reason why that was a particularly brilliant choice was that this house was designed and built uh, from 1907, which is the year of publication uh, of Howard's End. Uh, and yet it was used in that book to be a kind of evocation of a, what they would call, no doubt, a timeless uh, English, English house. Now, in this house, again, you can't really tell what is old and what is new, except in certain areas of it. The right-hand wing, for example, is all Caro. The bit that runs, the bit that runs between that and the left-hand wing, which is mostly, but not completely, uh, 17th century or very early 18th possibly, that bit, the half-timber bit, there you'll get completely lost very quickly as to what is old and what is new. There was a medieval core to the house. Uh, there was a slightly older, uh, slightly later farmhouse around it. Uh, and Caro went across the building, adapting and moving and mixing uh, and taking very often bits from other houses. Uh, in some cases, let me show you this one, for example, uh, it, you, it, the, the, the general configuration does not appear to be, for example, a medieval or a 16th century configuration. But nevertheless, it's difficult, unless you're a particular specialist in this area, to be able to put your finger on what is particularly new and what is particularly not. This ceiling, for example, was a Jacobean ceiling, which he bought from a house that was being demolished in uh, the north of Wales. And he moved it in here. Um, together with uh, other bits and pieces from, from other houses. In some cases, he took out old features. Now, you will know, uh, from uh, because it's one of the main uh, themes, really, of late 19th century conservation about the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, and it's a central part of SPAB dogma that you shouldn't touch the oldest bits, and that you should leave them as they are. They've got to be identifiable. It's the dogma which, for example, will crop up if you put in an application to change an old building today, uh, for example, either uh, a pre-17th century, a pre-18th century one, or a Victorian one, and you get an opinion from the Victorian society or from SPAB today, they will tell you right away that they don't like this blurring of the boundaries between the old bit and the new bit. It's a very strong theme. But, uh, and Caro, what's interesting here was that Caro did things that really annoyed them uh, and fought them on many occasions. One example of, uh, that he did was that in an upper part of his house there was a there was, a, a, there was a, a beam going across a corridor that was too low for him to be able to walk under uh, on, the on what had become the bedroom corridor. So what he did was he cut it out and he put a new one, steel one, I think, above the ceiling level, and then he built a thing that looked a bit. He designed himself. He did it all himself. He was a very busy man, a massive practice, actually. But still, he still had time to do the details of his own house in the way that architects do he designed a new thing that represented the beam that had gone. Spab was apoplectic about this. This looked to them what Pugin would have called a sham, a fake. But this didn't, it isn't the only way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that the representation of what had been there before in a whole new design, resolution of that particular design problem, that is the thing that makes it interesting and valuable. He did other things, too, even in the parts of the house which are, for other reasons, well known. Just beyond the door at the end, there is a, a very early barn conversion. The first barn conversion that I've managed to find, actually, was designed for that eccentric person, Marco Asquith, uh, in 1912. Uh, the first barn conversion in the modern sense. That's to say the, um, the, the turning of a house with very little in the way of interventions uh, and a few bits of tasteful furniture to make a kind of summer holiday place. That, that, that was done by Margot Asquith. This is a few years before that, although not many, and five or so. Uh, and here, uh, Caro took an old, an, old, um, an, an old barn 
uh, and turned it into a big billiard room, a party room, actually, where they would do um, have parties and hold performances of plays. Uh, but what he did also was he moved things around so that he, he rotated the old timber piers inside the barn so that the worn sides that had been abraded by cattle over the years were hidden. They faced inside rather than outside. And he did other things, too. He reused the uh, wall plates as, um, as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as roof joists, for example. So he fiddled around with a bit and made something new uh, in order to do it. So um, this is the point at which I'd like to conclude whenever we address the question of what is old and what is new in an old building. The first thing to say is that it, it, it's not necessarily, really, the question of what is old and what is new. It's very often the collection of it. If you were as frustrated as I was, and I'm sure Emily, uh, Emily perhaps is a calmer person than me, but when you saw uh, the 19th century stonework on the uh, television news in England being described as medieval, then we all feel, oh, what are they talking about? But you can see where it comes from. So this idea that you must be able to define things as one way or the other. But the truth is that much of very good Edwardian architecture, in fact, it might almost be fair to say, the great majority of Edwardian architecture, and it was, after all, until the high-tech period, the only period of architectural design that was copied across the world. The great value of it, in fact, is that it lies in being a palimpsest and not as being simply one thing up against another. So our next speaker is Karen uh, Jones from the School of History, Professor Jones, uh, who is going to, um, who is an enthusiastic supporter of environmental history. She mentions landscape history and animal study studies. So she researches, she's professor of environmental and cultural history, and here she's going to be contentious and provocative in opposing the protection of the environment, or what is called also the natural environment, with natural heritage, with a cultural heritage. Both are sometimes pit against each other. Also, they should be, in my view, you know, seen as an ensemble and working together, but it is not always the case. So, Karen, if you want to put that. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sophie. I'm, I'm slightly wor worried now that I'm uh, not going to be as provocative as the billing, but I'll do my best. Um, right, let's find my slides. As, as Sophie mentioned, my um, expertise is in environmental history. So being indoors in uh, Notre Dame is, is, a, is, is somewhat of a, a rare academic sojourn for me. I spend most of my time outside. So I've worked on North American national parks. And, and most recently, um, I'm working on a a project that's looking at city parks in, in London and their formation and evolution within an urban landscape as, and, and the idea particularly that's um, developed over time of parks as lungs for the city. Um, so I'm interested in ideas of urban meta metabolism and space and it, it struck me when, when Emily was talking about belonging and the place of a, of a landmark within an urban centre, that the, the the idea of a, a metabolic landscape, a, a, an organic landscape of flow and circulation, might be an interesting way to explore this space, um, this 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 built landmark of Paris, in in the sense of seeing the entanglements of nature and culture and people and and, and other species. So um, so that's where I'm going to um, go with for for this short talk. So as, as um, Sophie alluded to at the beginning, the, the roof structure of, of, of Notre Dame is famously um, regarded as the forest. And you can see from this slide here the kind of network of conjoined uh, wooden oak beams dating back to the 12th century, which, which form um, an important evocative and aesthetic and structural part of this, um, uh, this building. And of course, failed to survive 
um, the fire for obvious reasons being being quite flammable. Um, so these oak beams collectively came from old growth forests, some 13,000 trees that were felled to create um, this, this Gothic cathedral. And at the time of the felling in 12th century, some of these trees were already three to 400 years old. So they're significant and sizable um, arboreal structures in their own right. Um, so in, in making a, a forest from a forest, you know, this is a huge logistical and uh, engineering work that involved huge trees manufactured into beams 100 meters long, needing to support um, a, a massive weight of roof, some 210 tons. So, you know, the, the, uh, the workings of this in terms of thinking about resources and, and the acquisition of this material is an important story in its own right. Now, the issues are, though, that deforestation, even in the 12th century, was an important issue. So the taking of these trees um, was part of a significant change to the medieval landscape, which is, which is worth noting. This, of course, creates even more problems today um, in, a, in a world of significantly greater and more intensive environmental transformation. Um, where you know the impacts of human activity and the Anthropocene are felt all over the global biota. So, um, were we to think about replicating that roof, uh, where would we find the forest for the forest? Is a pertinent environmental and uh, uh, historical restoration issue. Um, the old growth forests, which would be needed for this perfect facsimile um, are, are scarce. Um, only 4% of European woodland cover contains these old growth forests, mo much of which is in Russia, uh, in northern and, and European, uh, northern and eastern Europe. So this raises a difficult environmental bargain, which is worth preserving more. The old growth forests that's supporting ecosystems um, or the, the uh, functional restoration of Notre Dame's roof. So that, that's, I think, a, a, a pertinent question to be thinking about in an age of, of climate change and um, you know, environmental tipping points. So this question of what is old and what is new that, and how to fit those together that, that Tim um, alluded to in, in his uh, presentation is brought into sharp relief when you start questioning environmental sustainability and historic preservation um, in this context. And so, you know, there have been various different solutions and scenarios proposed as to what to do in this um, in the light of this, this issue, how to put the roof back together, whether in fact to um, find wood from other sources. And of course, that's one potential um, solution to find regrown trees, newer trees from sustainable sources, uh, which cynics claim is, you know, um, a solution that's championed by the timber industry. Um, other solutions to, that have been suggested include using uh, plate glass and steel, uh, concrete, and perhaps in the most esoteric of solutions, Ghanaian bog wood, which is kind of fossilized wood that has been um, submerged in the water. This slide on, on the right um, reflects this. It's been submerged in the water since a dam was constructed in the 1960s, and so it's created all, all of these um, pieces of fossilized um, oak that are seen as 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 robust and durable, and um, a, and, a, and a good export for the Ghanaian economy. An African hardwood, which in character is similar to oak, um, but of course. Critics and opponents of this plan point to the consequences for this underwater ecosystem. You know, the the 
stirring up as sediment and the, and the dispersal of fish and other species that are living in this place. So restoration then is a really complicated and difficult question, both at Notre Dame and elsewhere. And I think it's became more starkly evident in chewing over these issues last summer in the light of the uh, burning of the Amazon forests and indeed one might say in more recent times looking to Australia you know how how do we deal with these questions of restoration in an environmental age now Monsignor Patrick Chauvet uh, rector of Notre Dame saw these issues as entirely separate um, and of course you know, in many ways, many ways they are. He pointed out one is about the climate and an ecological problem for the future of our planet. And in France, Notre Dame is about a treasure, a heritage, and it's also important for tourism as a sort of uh, addendum. Um, and so his comment comes on the back of the the millions and or billions of, of um, euros that, uh, that was committed to restoring that Notre Dame from benefactors across the world. And obviously, you know, for some climate change activists, the comment was made, well, actually, could this money be used for better things? Questions of heritage and value. What do we pay to keep and what's the most important? Different people have different views. Now, in some of the reconfigurations of Notre Dame, there's been an attempt to um, engage with an ecological agenda in terms of the restoration. This... Um, uh, particular design from Belgian Vincent Calibo is designed to do, it seems to me, pretty much everything, you know, to, to save Paris, uh, the ecological and spiritual heart of Paris in, in one foul swoop by creating an urban garden, um, uh, putting carbon fibre uh, um, slabs in, fuel cells, um, areas for fruit and veg growing and you know to basically do everything in one particular place um, but it does present a question about purpose and sustainability and, and urban living and how we how we place historic preservation in this context so I just wanted to introduce or revisit this idea of nature versus culture in the landscape of preservation um, where do we restore to? Now, me as an environmental historian, you know, if you look at landscape change, um, restoration of, of, of species, for instance, it's, it's you know, a real dilemma to think about what's the baseline for a natural system. Where is that perfect point in a, in a, a biotic environment that's constantly changing? But the same also applies to built structures that uh, in a way that dynamic between freezing something in time but also paying heed to, to the ever-changing um, context of, of, of place and people. So these were a few thoughts, I suppose, to, to throw out in thinking about historic preservation in, in an age of climate insecurity. And of course, you know, there is another angle to this which is thinking about the impacts of um, changes in our weather patterns and, and, and flooding and flood resilience for historic buildings. It's an important part of this equation too. Um, but cultural value is about thinking, um, of valuing nature, of thinking what is heritage and to whom is it valuable? Who is paying for it? Who gets to decide which version of heritage comes to the fore? And I think in this world of natural and cultural hybridity, um, questions of uh, sustainability become incredibly important um, and actually raise complicated and important questions but, but do um, present real opportunities for people from different disciplines and from different practices to, to have meaningful conversations about what heritage is. And that's when I'll finish. Thank you.
So our last, thank you, thank you, Karen. Our last speaker is um, Andrew Edwards, who is um, Executive Director of Strategic Development at the Cathedral of Canterbury. Um, he is responsible for a wide ranging portfolio, including the strategic development of the cathedral's commercial and enterprise businesses, uh, the Cathedral Trust, Friends of Canterbury Cathedral, the Visitor Welcome, etc. He, he studied comparative religion and philosophy at King's College London, and his career has encompassed leadership roles in a wide range of cultural and not for profit organizations, including the English National Opera, the South Bank Centres, Wills Millenniums, etc. So it's our great pleasure to have Andrew here today to talk about, if I may say so, oh, philanthropy. <laughs> Th thank you. Um, I've really, I, I'm really selling you short here because I, I've, I've neither got very pretty pictures to show you, um, and I'm going to talk money, which is always the ugly word um, sometimes in, in, in this discussion. I was, I was thinking quite hard over the weekend over how I was going to approach this and, and, and what I wanted to say. And I thought perhaps the best way of doing this was perhaps to talk a little bit about the last 15 years of my professional life, because for the last 15 years, I've been very much involved in ecclesiastical heritage, both running organizations that give money, but also um, working for organizations that have to raise that money. And I suppose over that 15 years, I have seen quite, a, I think, a quite a considerable shift, certainly in the way heritage is perceived and the value that is, that, that is placed upon, upon heritage. 15 years ago, for my sins, I rather randomly, one weekend looking at the Sunday Times, applied for a job that appealed to me, um, which was the chief executive of an organization called the Historic Churches Preservation Trust. I'd never heard of it at all, but being someone who had all my, my sort of life had had an interest in religion, um, I thought I'd give it a go. And I applied, and, I, and I, strangely enough, I, I got the job. And I, I walked into this rather dusty trust sitting in, in, in the centre of London that had been set up in the 1950s um, and had been set up in the 1950s following quite a, quite a detailed review initiated by the government into the condition of what was then described as Her Majesty's Churches. And this review was coming on the back of, I suppose, I suppose, sort of lack of conservation and care during the Depression and then damage caused by sort of the World War II. And this trust was set up as an independent body to raise money um, for repair projects for, for, for um, churches right the way throughout the UK. So about 47,000 places of worship. So everything from sort of your parish churches right the way through to your Quaker meeting houses, etc. And it's interesting to look right back over that entire period, I suppose the first 20 years of its existence, where it was hugely successful. It ran major exhibitions on the London Underground. It had major West End um, events in, 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 in the theatre, and sort of reinforced in my mind how much more mainstream religion was in our lives at that point. And therefore, there was a real generosity, both in spirit and in money, from the public who, who supported it. Interestingly, every British Prime Minister had been a trustee of this of this organization right up to Margaret Thatcher. So it was very much sort of mainstream. When I walked in um, to this, it was a very different sort of situation. The whole sort of religious life of this country had shifted quite considerably. And here you had, as I said, 47,000 buildings all in need of money to do, to, to do various things. And it's interesting when, when you sit back and, and reflect that half the grade one listed buildings in England are churches. And if you think about it, the way churches are looked after, most of them are cared for pretty well by largely aging members of the congregation who are volunteers who have no experience in how to look after these, these buildings. Anybody that's traveled around Norfolk, as just one example, will be dazzled by the sheer array of, of grade one medieval churches. And it becomes apparent when you start looking at this that, of course, these buildings, as, as, they, as time goes on, they're always in need of work, always in need of major conservation 
projects and the dreaded quinquennial, which comes up every five years, which provides the report on the condition of those buildings, sets all the heartbeats going and can quite often raise quite alarming targets that those churches have to sort of deal with. I was always struck by the fact that it was a total lottery in terms of how successful these buildings were in raising money. If your church warden happened to be a retired bank manager, for example, the likelihood is you'd be much more successful in raising the money because that person would have much more familiarity with filling out endless application forms, going through the process, which is very time consuming. If your church warden happened, as I, and I came across it many, many times, happened to be the very nice lady who lived in the village, who'd spent all her life there, who loved this building, and was suddenly faced, because her architect had told her, that they had to raise half a million pounds to replace the roof of that building. And she would come in with the report and say, where do I start? And whilst running this trust, we recognized that the old-fashioned model, which we had, which was we went out, we raised money, and then we gave it back in terms of repair grants to these churches, was really starting to get a little bit antiquated and was no longer really meeting the needs. So being a sort of an independent body, unlike those around us who were either connected to the Church of England or connected to the various religious denominations, we started, we managed to secure the help of the management consultants, McKinsey's, who came in and did probably one of the most extensive surveys of these buildings that had been carried out, particularly in, in, in the Anglican church. And this was asking the communities who were responsible for these churches what they thought about these buildings and how they felt they were going to, to raise the money. When the report was completed, we then presented it back to the heritage sector. And I can remember one frightening night in Fleet Street at, at my chairman's bank, where we gathered all the great and the good of, of the ecclesiastical world to present this report from McKinsey's. And McKinsey's took it very simply. They had, they had three categories. They basically said, in this country, you have churches that are the sort of the pevsners. You've got to, pot, you've got to protect them at all cost, irrespective of whether they're used or not. You then have those church buildings which are more modern, perhaps more 1960s, 1970s, who really are of no architectural interest whatsoever, but actually fulfill a really important role in their community. And then you have your third category, which is sort of nothing, really. They're, they're neither architecturally important, neither are they actually providing any support to the community. The sector ran like mad from this, um, not least the church, because effectively what McKinsey's was saying was, in a sensible, economic, money-led world, you would get rid of a third of your estate. The church, of course, interprets that as being seen as declining congregations, the, the world of faith is changing, and it's seen in very negative terms. So we never, very, we never really got very far. During that whole period, I think, and, and the Heritage Lottery Fund was growing in importance and was being seen as one of the main, um, I suppose, main sort of providers of financing for these buildings. I can remember going to talk to the vicar of St. Martin in the Fields, and I'm, some of you will remember St. Martin in the Field was one of the very first churches to undergo a major, major restoration project with help from the Heritage Lottery Fund. When I asked the vicar, Nick Holton there, now the Bishop of Salisbury, well, you know, Nick, how, why were you successful in this? Well, how did you achieve it? How did you get the money and, and make it work? And he said, because everything we wanted to do in the church was central to our mission, and it was a central part of, of, of what the church was doing. So we played around for a number of years in, in this sector. We introduced grant, grant categories that would enable churches to spend money on creating new facilities in their buildings. The whole thrust became one of, if your, ch your church needs to be a central part of your community if it is to be economically viable. Well, because as everybody knows, a lot of these medieval buildings particularly are not equipped to be centers um, of communities. And very often, I would come across congregations who had had to leave their church because major work was going on, had moved down the road to the village hall where they then met. When we actually sorted out the church, they actually didn't want to go back because the village hall was much warmer. It had kitchens, it had toilets, it had all the things that modern communities need. So we introduced grant categories that was very much aimed at providing 
those facilities as a way of enabling these churches to be, to be much more adept. When I then um, was approached by Canterbury Cathedral to come and work for them, I, I can remember saying to, to the dean of the cathedral, why would you want me? Um, I've not really got any experience in major capital fundraising. Um, I'm sure there are lots of people out there much better equipped to do this job. And his, his answer was, I think he felt, I had a sort of an empathy and an understanding of the peculiarity of church religious organizations, and therefore was much more likely to be successful in that I had a sort of a broader understanding, as I said, of, of how it all works. When I went to Canterbury, um, I, I remember one of the very first meetings I had, and I was there principally as the chief executive of their trust, which was raising money. And I can remember sitting in, in this meeting saying, so what is the priority for the, for, for the building? What, what is it we need to focus on? And these rather gloomy sort of faces are sitting there saying, well, we need a new roof for the nave. And I said, well, how much is that, is that going to cost? And they looked at the sort of side horror and said, well, it's probably going to be about 11 to 12 million pounds. So I thought, right, OK, that's, that's an interesting challenge. Um, when I went to the States um, to, to one of our American board meetings, I can remember talking to a couple of American philanthropists at a dinner, and I was explaining my sort of time at the cathedral. And I said, they said, so what is the priority then? I said, well, at the moment, we need a new roof for the nave. And he looked at me and said, please tell me you're not coming to America to raise money for a roof. And I said, well, you know, it's like homes. If the roof isn't right, nothing else is, is, is right in the house. But we very quickly realized at Canterbury that going out, even Canterbury Cathedral, which is a fairly big global brand, was going to have a challenge in raising those sorts of monies for a, for a roof. When you actually look at the history of the cathedral, you'll see a repeated pattern emerges. And you'll notice that roughly about every 30 years or so, the cathedral in its history has had to go out with a major appeal. I think it's the needs catch up and therefore, and eventually, through the quinquennial, the chapter at any given time has no choice but to go out and look to raise quite significant money. And you can go right back to the sort of, even to the 70s, with Lord Astor's campaign in, the, I think it was 74, which was very much showing the cathedral in a sort of doomy, gloomy sort of image with a headline, Save Canterbury Cathedral. I don't believe for a minute that the cathedral was about to fall down, but I think it was that slight sense of panic and getting people to respond. Well, when I, was, when I first started at the cathedral, life was very different, and we were in no position to go out with a Save Canterbury Cathedral um, sort of slogan. Um, I suppose my experience in the arts had taught me that when people are going to be generous, particularly individuals are going to be generous to you, what they buy is they buy aspiration and vision. They don't buy doom and gloom, and they're not particularly interested in sticking plasters that are just going to sort of prop up a bit more for a bit longer. So we took the decision at the cathedral to go to what was then the Heritage Lottery Fund, which was the biggest grant-giving body. And... We, our very first meeting that we sat with the HLF officers and um, they asked, well, what is your project? And we looked at them and said, well, we need a new roof for the nave. And they kept looking at us and saying, yes, but what is your project? And of course, this was a, a, a completely different mindset for Canterbury in recognizing that we were never going to be able to go out and just secure 12 million pounds from a public purse just to put a new nave, a roof on, on the nave. That we were gonna have to develop a project that was going to have to demonstrate a number of things that was going to resonate with, with the Heritage Lottery Fund. So we spent the best part of three years, and I mean three years, developing what is now, and you can see on, on, on the picture, the Canterbury Journey um, as a project. But it was called the Journey because if you were going to the public purse for money, you couldn't, they don't fund faith-based projects, which is a slight sort of madness when you think we're a cathedral. Um, journey was seen as being a secular way of expressing the whole tradition of pilgrimage that was a sort of in Canterbury's DNA. But over that, over that three year period, we developed what is now, and will be completed next year, the best part of a 30 million pound project. And that will have seen not only us have dealing with the, really the most urgent conservation needs of the building itself, which is, as I said, replacing 
the roof um, on, on, on the nave, dealing with the two west towers, but also more importantly, an opportunity to re-landscape the area around the cathedral. Anybody that has gone across that precinct with somebody with a mobility issue or somebody new will know exactly what I mean. We had to get that right. And we'll also, for the first time, I suppose, in, in the cathedral's history, we'll see a major injection of finance into our work in interpretation, our curatorial work, and our visitor experience. So we will also open um, a brand new visitor welcome centre um, later this year. So it's been an extensive sort of process. When we went to the HLF, um, like a great many other organisations, we got turned down the first time. That was an interesting experience in a cathedral where they're not used, Canterbury Cathedral was not used to being told no. Um, we went back, we redesigned the, the application and recognised that with the project we had, we were asking the HLF to contribute 60% of the cost of the project and we would then go out and raise from private sources the balance, which meant we had about 18 months to raise the best part of £14 million. Pounds. So quite a big an ambitious target. My view was that we had to take the most expedient route to that. So going out with a big public-based campaign was probably going to be hugely time-consuming and administratively heavy, and therefore we should focus on those individuals and organisations who are in a position to make quite serious six, seven-figure sum injections into the, into the building. I learned an awful lot through that process. What I learned was that that old idea of, you know, is fundraising a science? It isn't a science. It applies a certain amount of scientific principles, but it is also very much intuitive, and it is entirely relationship-led. If an individual is going to give you money to sort out your, your building, they're not deciding as to whether they're going to spend the money on that or any other cause. They will have, most likely, a strong belly passion for what, for what they want to do. And we dealt with some, you know... Strange. I remember talking to one American um, philanthropist again on the phone who said to me, and she'd been a huge supporter of major projects at Versailles, and I, I rang her and I said, we'd love you to come to an evening we're doing. And she said, well, why am I going to come to your evening? She said, you know, Andrew, on average I get about eight invitations a week to things. What is going to make your, your case stand out? So it's, it's, fundraising is a very strange business. To be, to be engaged with, because people come to you for all sorts of different reasons. One of the major sort of donors to this particular project was a gentleman who'd made an absolute fortune in his professional life dealing with cement. And I tried for nearly two years to get this man to come and visit us. He kept saying, I have no interest in, in, in the cathedral. Eventually, I think just my continual pressure, he just gave in and said, fine, I'll come. He rang me the night before and said, if you think I'm going to be making a major gift to the cathedral, I don't want to raise your expectations, uh, but I'll come along anyway. We brought him along, we took him round, we did the usual stuff, giving him a very nice lunch, sitting there trying to wine and dine as, as you do, making our case. And quite clearly, he, he, he wasn't going to buy it. So as we were leaving, I said to him, I said, if, you, if you've got a spare 10 minutes, perhaps you'd like to come up and meet some of our stonemasonry team. So he said, oh, yeah, no, I'd like that. So we went upstairs, and at the time, the architect um, was there and the head of our stonemasonry. And they were debating the particular approach they were going to take to the restoration of Christ Church Gate. And this gentleman that was with me had an enormous interest in this. As I said, he'd made his career through, 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 through manufacturing cement. So he sat there, and for the next hour, I witnessed the most horrendous argument between these, these three people, with this particular gentleman trying to get my colleagues to, take, to approach this particular task in a particular way. And I thought, crumbs, this is it. You know, Move on. We're, never, we're, we're not going to get any engagement here. And as we left the building, he said to me, um, you know, he said, that's the best hour I've had in years. He said, that was fascinating. He said, that, that sort of debate over, over the particular approach they were going to take. Now, he's actually single-handedly almost funded the entire restoration of Christ Church Gate. But that's not because he was a churchgoer or because he had a particular interest in, in Canterbury Cathedral. It was purely based on the fact that the, the approach 
that the conservators were taking intrigued him professionally and as an engineer. And he was able to have that, that very, very close engagement um, around the process. So I, I suppose, you know, I, th I think in many respects, you know, raising money is, is always difficult. But I, but I do think that, you know, over the last, I suppose, 25, 30 years, this country has seen largely as a result of what was the Heritage Lottery Fund, but now the National Lottery Heritage Fund, probably the biggest injection and investment in, 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 our, in our built heritage that, than ever before. And I just quoted, you know, I think it was about 7.9 billion pounds has been distributed to over 43,000 heritage projects across the UK. And I think what that has done, um, in another way is also force organizations just like my own here to actually really think about what that heritage means and how you make it work because you know that line it's not enough to save something you've got to make it live i think sort of underpins all of this this is this project has made the cathedral think much more cleverly and much more strategically about how we go out and engage with different communities and how those communities engage with us. It's made us think about our interpretation. It's made us think about how all those wonderful things that us and many other places across the world have hidden away in our archives, how we bring them out and how we get people to engage with them. So I see it as a good period in, in, in funding for, for these projects. And I think, you know, it, as I said, it's, it's, it's forcing us as, as custodians of these buildings to think much more cleverly about it's not just a case of protecting the architectural merit and the, and the history of the building. It's about how we make those buildings work in a 21st century context. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers for their fascinating conversation and also you know different ideas that were thrown in so i would like now to open the floor open the floor to questions do you have does anyone have any questions yes please do you mind if you use the microphone oh you've got another one so i think i've got two this is perhaps an obvious question but um You've, you've given a lot of thought to the challenge of how does one rebuild the roof of Canterbury Cathedral. <laughs> um, if, if the guys from Paris came along and said, you know, raising all the issues that Karen was talking about, how, how should we approach this, what, what would your advice be? Um, I'm not an architect, and, I, I, and you know, I, I, I defer to my colleagues in, 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 in all these things, but I think, you know, in, in a way... Many years ago, St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue um, launched a campaign, and they had this terribly cheesy line, um, which was, no one generation builds a cathedral. And I think that's very much, you know, these are buildings that have evolved over great periods of time. And I think I take the view, which is, we have to look at these things in the sense of where we are now and the needs of where we are now and adapt accordingly. I don't think we should be too prescriptive in our, in our approach. We have, listening to, to colleagues here talk about the environment, we're having great conversations at the moment about the fact that at the end of next year, we will have come out of this particular project. And we are now talking about how we can best support the environment and, and, and the question around sustainability movement, what that means for a place like, like Canterbury Cathedral. You know, here you have the Mother Church of the Anglican Communion. We have the Lambeth Conference, as some of you will know later this year. And half the bishops attending that are going to come from parts of the world that are directly affected daily by the changes in the environment. So how does the Mother Church resp respond to that? So I think the question is, as I said, I would have to defer to my colleagues to, 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 uh, in terms of detail, but I don't think we should be too prescriptive, and I think we should be creative in our thinking. I, I like this idea, Andrew. I'm, I, I think that sounds a fab fabulous project number two. Um, and maybe the uh, digging up the car park and reinstalling the medieval fish ponds would be a lovely part of, uh, <laughs> of that. I'm struck by the, the Psalter that we, we looked at as part of our, our studies. 
Um, so yeah, nothing to add. Just just to just to champion the fish ponds for. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, I've heard quite a lot about economics and the environment and how that would uh, affect the design slash, you know, how the project would be run. But how much of a role does faith and religion play in how you would, in your decision for what you think would be the best option? Well, I, I guess it could apply to Canterbury Cathedral or Notre Dame. That's to anyone. I think going back to, to, to the Canterbury Journey project, which is the project we're currently delivering at the moment, we had quite, quite an interesting discussion around interpretation and how the cathedral itself, which is, of course, a, a working, functioning church, and that balance between maintaining that but not at the same time becoming a sort of theme park or, or, or a gallery. And I was aware, particularly talking to my clerical colleagues, as to how far I could take these, these discussions. And we had many, many heated debates around exhibition areas on the cathedral floor, um, how we would animate the cloisters. Um, even at one point we had conversations around talking benches in the precinct that you could sit down and they would tell you something about what you were looking at. So I think it's a very, very fine balance that you, you have to achieve. But first and foremost, and everything that guides the way we approach Canterbury is that it is first and foremost a working church and a functioning church. And we can't really lo lose sight of that. What I found when I was, I was a member for a long time of the Buildings Committee of the Victorian Society where we look at proposals to change uh, the, uh, usually the ordering of churches on the inside and we soon discovered that the problem with the churches had was either they had too much money or they had too little money and the, the most striking thing was how often it was the ones who had too much money and were desperate to move the building around for what they saw as liturgical or operating purposes. Uh, they, they were much more of a threat than the people with, with, with too little money. Uh, sometimes this can be quite extreme. There's a long tradition in the, in, in the actually I think more in the Church of England than outside the Church of England, uh, of uh, wanting to um, alter or destroy buildings in order to make a point from a faith point of view that the fabric of the building is not important. We did a, w I was once sent a book to review, a tablet actually of all things, uh, which in which every parish church in Devon was given 50 words to describe their church and their operations. The high church people uh, all described their beautiful Butterfield font and their wonderful 13th century carvings and so on. The evangelical churches never mentioned the building at all. We're a wonderful, welcoming community and so on. Not a word, not a word about the building. And there is, of course, a, uh, a book which Andrew in particular will be particularly familiar with called Repitching the Tent, which not only tells you how to smash your church up, uh, but also has illustrations of happy people doing the smashing. There's one where there's a whole, there's a little procession of happy people waving and cheering as they leave their half-demolished Victorian church and move into a warehouse outside Peterborough. Remember that one? Well, the, that's, uh, that, that, that's a long theme that's been around in England for a long time, but I can give you a specific example which is to do with a cathedral and which is to do with the, distract, the destruction from natural causes of a cathedral, and that was in Christchurch in, in New Zealand. Now, what happened there was that the building, first of all, this uh, his story where the architect emerges as a kind of hero was our old friend George Gilbert Scott of St Pancras uh, Hotel fame. Now, Scott said to them, you have earthquakes around here. The last thing you want is a masonry cathedral. And they said, no, no, we've got to have a proper cathedral that looks like a proper cathedral in England. So they persuaded him uh, to build a masonry cathedral, and it stood there for 150 years or so, and then half of it came down in the series. Of now, what happened there was that the was that the church authorities immediately said, "Oh, what's left here is far too dangerous to be left up," and they started to talk up the danger to people in order to have it pulled down. Now, the not just the architectural historians um, at the at the at um, Canterbury University, but also uh, the others involved in from the from the um, from the city and from the building point of view, said at least half of this building is perfectly savable, can keep it. You could 
uh, complete it again. You could do something else with the bit that's left, I suppose, in a way that happened to, to, to Coventry Cathedral, but more conservatively than that. You could keep it. But the church itself was absolutely desperate to, um, to, to, uh, to get rid of it and to pretend that the, that the ruins are more serious than they were. Sometimes this process goes into reverse. You will know, I hope, every, everyone has been there, uh, the um, the Church of St. Augustine in Ransgate, the Pugin Church, and this was smashed up in about 1971 by somebody actually who uh, was we well rec was an active member of the Victorian Society Casework Committee, as irony would have it. Uh, and the uh, priest at the time did a very sensible thing, which is he kept the bits. They moved some of them to other places of the church, but essentially what had happened was that the screen was taken down between the chancel uh, and the nave, uh, and moved somewhere else, and all the choir seating on the inside was was hidden away in a cupboard. That meant that when the church had a very energetic priest, uh, Father Marcus Holden, that he was able to put it all back together again. And what was very gratifying for an architect was that the purpose of, t of smashing it up in the 1970s had been to make what was considered to be an open space, that there would be no obstruction between it in the normal way of Vatican II, that the priest would face the congregation instead of turning away from it in the in the traditional fashion, uh, but also that the place would be opened up and it would be brighter and it would be lighter and this, that, and the next thing. What is very striking is that when the Pugin screen went back in and when the Pugin fittings went back in, all completely contrary to modern practice in, in the Catholic Church, uh, the building was so much more successful uh, as a community space. It had much more depth to it. It also, interestingly, very strikingly, although the, the chancel was now blocked off again from, from the nave, the whole place seemed much taller and much more open. In other words, Pugin did know what he was doing when he designed it the first time around. It's not something that you can necessarily guess uh, as a layman, whether you're a church layman uh, or whether you're not. One final thing, uh, you don't mind me going on a bit about this, but I'll just be 30 seconds on it. One of the striking characteristics of British 19th century history is that the is that church history, Anglican history, but not only Anglican, Catholic and nonconformist history, church history and architectural history are in fact the same thing. So enormous was the impact of the ecclesiological society that it becomes impossible to distinguish the two. You can't talk about one without talking about the other. There's no other country that I know of where this was the case. faith and rebuilding and its history. One of my favorite things to teach my students is the story of the rebuilding of Chartres Cathedral, which is also dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And like Canterbury Cathedral here down the hill, which caught fire in September of 1174, a devastating fire <laughs> destroyed most of the, the fabric of Chartres Cathedral, um, which is just to the south of Paris in 1194. But in terms of faith, um, the whole community was astounded to discover that their very sacred relic, believed to be the tunic of the Virgin Mary, worn during the nativity, so it's a contact relic of Christ too, was still extant. So this was considered a miracle, and it prompted what we call the cult of carts. So the whole community, therefore, thought that the Virgin still wanted her house back, and they gave their own carts up to be used for equipment to be um, uh, const used for construction. So in that case, faith was necessary to prompting the um, uh, financial support of the rebuilding project in the late 12th century. And it's, it's a wonderful story. There's lots of songs about it and even gothic stained glass windows that show her miraculous tunic surviving in the fire. So, um, so sometimes faith is necessary for the money too. separation between church and the French state and the Catholic Church. And in 1905, the French, uh, the French government took responsibility for all cathedrals mm. and local churches are responsibility of the local villages. So it, the burden falls mainly on the state to pay for repairs because of that. So that's also one of the reasons why the person who is in charge of the general of the army is not yeah. a successful man. <laughs> Thanks, thanks very much, and uh, thanks to all the speakers for the very interesting papers. Um, Notre Dame um, 
really exemplifies architecture as palimpsest. And the French are very much attached to the fact that uh, it was redesigned, re largely rebuilt um, after, the, after the revolution and the building as it stood before the fire owed a lot to Viollet-le-Duc. Viollet and the argument between the architect and the general was in fact about the spire on Notre Dame, uh, which was designed and built by Viollet-le-Duc. And the architect was saying that uh, it would be a good idea to mark the renovation, the renaissance of Notre Dame with a newly designed modern spire, whereas the general was getting shirty because he was insistent that the restored cathedral should have a facsimile of the 19th century spire designed by Viollet-le-Duc. Um, what strikes me about Notre Dame is that it's built on a spot which the French refer to as kilomètre zéro. It's point zero for France. So everywhere else in France, where it is situated, is measured according to its distance from Notre Dame. And so all other places in France are attached to Notre Dame as it were, by a kind of spoke. Mm. The whole of France mm. splays out around Notre Dame, around Kilometre Zero. Mm. It's also, I think, important to the French because the place has been... The added value of Notre Dame comes in part from Victor Hugo, who's a secular saint for France, a republican saint, but who wrote such a powerful novel Notre Dame de Paris, uh, with the character of uh, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the hunchback of Notre Dame, Quasimodo. All of this has, uh, seems to be extremely strong still in French consciousness, and so gives the cathedral a cultural, republican, secular value, which is added to the extraordinary religious significance of the cathedral in France. And it's an unbroken spiritual tradition since the um, conversion of Clovis, if you like, mm -hmm. whereas Canterbury Cathedral has in a way changed its affiliation from attachment to Rome yeah. to attachment to England and the English church. Mm -hmm. Whereas in France, there's that historical and spiritual continuity mm. attached to Notre Dame, which mm. makes it all the more important for that part of French identity. And uh, you were saying in a fascinating way how difficult it is. You said how hard it is to raise funds. Yeah. But significantly in France, there was, the church was almost embarrassed mm. by the amount of money that mm. flooded in. Mm. And this in itself caused mm. controversy. Mm. And you had industrial magnets pouring millions of euros mm. into the project. Because Notre Dame is such a strong brand, yeah. it actually would enhance yeah. the, the, the value of their luxury good brands yeah. in France. Yeah. And all of that, I'm saying, just because I think that Notre Dame is a special case what you were saying about architectural palimpsest is obviously relevant to Notre Dame, but some of the comparisons, I think, don't quite work because I think that Notre Dame has a status in France which is different to any building I can think of in the UK because of the things I've just been saying. Mm. The French are also attached to it because it's free to enter. Mm. Anyone can enter Notre Dame without paying a penny. Mm. Whereas one is sometimes surprised in Britain. Yeah. I grew up visiting St. Paul's. Yeah. And I felt at home in St. Paul's. Yeah. When I took my children to visit St. Paul's, we were immediately faced with a till. Yeah. And for a family to visit St. Paul's or to visit Can Canterbury Cathedral, for some families, it's a small fortune. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I actually took my kids away. I was outraged. 
this was years ago. This was 25 years ago when I cooked, took my, I hadn't been to, to St. Paul's for mm. decades and I took them away. We didn't go in. I was shocked yeah. because I remembered I used to go there on my bicycle yeah. and I just felt at home there and in the Whispering Gallery. And so all, for all of those reasons, um, I think there's a difference between Notre Dame and, uh, and Canterbury mm. Cathedral. And I'm just wondering whether you agree with me on that, or is that just uh, a kind of Francophile's view of, uh, of Notre Dame? Is there any building in, uh, in Britain, can Canterbury Cathedral here in Kent, rival Notre Dame in the spiritual, political, cultural and artistic resonance and importance that Notre Dame does have in France? Question at the end of the long speech. Well, it's very telling, isn't it? The, the, the hub is, you know, it's Hyde Park Corner. That's the place that almost <laughs> everywhere is measured. And if it isn't that, uh, on a good day, you might say that it was Piccadilly Circus. It's sort of places rather than individual buildings. But it's a very strong point that you make, and I think it's probably one that's not immediately obvious to most English people watching it on on the television, actually. So I'm very glad that you that you made that, because we, sh we shouldn't lose sight of it. The, um, I'm trying to think, the, uh, uh, I, should th I guess that Emily would know this. At Ely, mm -hmm. the octagon, mm -hmm. when Scott rebuilt it, he, ma he could have made it as it was, but he made it the same but better, didn't he? The, I'm thinking about the equivalent of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the flesh here. Yeah, I mean they c they could have he could have done, but he thought he could do it better, and he was right. And it is a mar it's a marvelous thing the Octagon at Ely, but no one goes to Ely. It's no, they don't go to Ely. No, no one is going to say that Ely is Notre Dame. That's absolutely <laughs> true. No, but it's a, it, it's an example of where yeah. they could have done, but they didn't because they knew better. I suppose the other thing that, that feeds into this, and I, I mean, this, this idea of the relationship between people and place in these circulations and, and sort of uh, metabolic relationships. And I, I like what you were saying, Andrew, about kind of a place being in, in the fabric of a city, but in, in the fabric of a country, and it, you know, it's, it's concentric, isn't it? But I wonder, too, the manner of Notre Dame's destruction. You know, not to invite anyone to start fires in, in Canterbury, of course, but something about the drama and the, s the severity of, you know, the, the generation of money from a disaster relief rather than a trickle of, um, of money over time, whether there's something in that, those of the, the evocativeness of, of I that. Say, I, I, I don't think one, one should underestimate that. I mean, we live in a world of, with, with technology which allows us to be sort of living through that, through, through, through that experience and watching that fire at Notre Dame on that particular evening and with the Dean of Canterbury on the other end of the phone who's about, was about to be interviewed for Sky News in, in response to that. We were living out this, this tragedy and I think that has a very strong em, 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 emotive, emotive feel. Um, the other point I would just make about pricing, um, because I, I, I have to sort of resp respond to that, because I think, in general terms, we all share that uncomfortableness ar 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 around pricing, but it is a it is a reality, and and it and it's the reality we have we have to live with. Canterbury Cathedral costs roughly about twenty thousand pounds a day to keep open. Now we're not going to be able to raise that from private sources. We can only do that through our charging structure at the gate but I think in an ideal world and we don't live in an ideal world I think I think of course we wouldn't have that charging um, regime it's just a reaction and a way of dealing with just the the reality of what of what we're faced with and of course that twenty thousand pounds a day doesn't come anywhere near to cover the cost of the of, of the conserva conservation so over the last you know what six seven years with the, the work that was done at Canterbury on the Great South Window which was a project that had not even been planned for, but a piece of masonry falls. Literally within 24 hours, as, a, as an organization, you're faced with a three million pound bill and you've got to find it. The government's not going to give it to us. So we have to go out and raise it. So I think we all share, um, you know, and again, I, I, I did a two year project for St. Paul's, exactly the same concerns. In an ideal world, there wouldn't be these charging structures, but I think it's it just- <laughs> It's but the it only way we can deal with the reality of the cost of what, of what, of what we're looking after. But it's interesting, isn't it, that in France the same, uh, Notre Dame must cost the same, yeah. 
but the government pays for it. Yeah. So it's the state. It's a, it's a different. That it's a different. It's a different structure. It's a yes. Because they own it. Yes. That that said, uh, one thing that's become apparent during the work now going on in Notre Dame yeah. um, is how poorly looked after the fabric of Notre Dame was yes, actually yes, yes. and the r the fire broke out yeah. because there was work going on there yeah. as in Windsor Windsor Chapel yeah. it's the same thing yes. an accident that occurs during work so apparently these projects are very dangerous are to the building on which they they're being carried yeah. out but it's 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 been realized i think in france that not only notre dame but many other ecclesiastical monuments in france they're free to go in but they're actually in a mouldering and poor yeah. condition and i must say that the work going on at saint paul's yeah. and in canterbury is bringing those buildings into yes. a splendid condition i mean i mean you know i i'm just saying you know when, when we come out of this particular piece of work next year we will have completed 15 years of major work at a price of about 50 million pounds that would be the biggest injection of capital into this building in probably its most recent history but we are like the fourth bridge and you know as we complete this cycle our surveyors it's a shame joe's not here tonight but our surveyor will be equally lining up um, we have issues with Bell Harry. We have issues with a number of structural things. We just have to take a pragmatic view and look at it and say, well, you know, to a certain extent, is it urgent? Is it time critical? And is it going to put the public at danger? And take a view as to when we can realistically timetable that work to be completed. But 50 million pounds over 15 years is not a bad period in the history of, of Canterbury in terms of the investment that's been, been made in the fabric. Uh, we've had the various issues uh, discussed. We haven't had a clear view of what would be each of the, your preferred solutions for Notre Dame. Would you like to give it as a, a closing? You mean referring to the old building or having something new? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, that's the way we plan until the beginning that the cathedral was a site of experimental architecture <laughs> when it was built. So that's really... A uh, good closing mm. question is what could a repair giver give, give us uh, their perspective on what should happen with the restoration? Yeah. I think that's a, a fascinating question to ask anybody, too, because you get a variety of responses. Um, I mean, the first thing I'll say, which I, I actually forgot to mention earlier, is that my uh, colleague who sadly passed away last year, a Professor Andrew Tallon, did a full digital scan of the interior and parts of the exterior of Notre Dame Cathedral. And now these video gamers that design Assassin's Creed are gonna use that data to create a totally replicated virtual environment of the cathedral. So the, the 21st century has its low points, but this is a really <laughs> exciting thing. So we will have a sort of livable replica in, our, in the next 10 years. They're gonna design this as a digital space and host it somewhere online. Um, my personal view would be to remain sensitive to the Gothic vision, but I use Gothic with a C and a K and an uppercase G and a lowercase G. Mm -hmm. So just as long as it looks like something like it was, but it's always been innovative. So I wouldn't be horrified if it was green or interesting or dynamic in a new way. Um, I just want it back. I want to teach there again. Uh, that's my, my view. Um, yeah, I think having something that is reflective of the 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 world in which the the place you know the the building is now that pays attention you know i'm i'm a historian so i'm 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 not for chucking out history um entirely but i think something that balances though that sense of layering and experimentation with an a, a, an attention the, to the contemporary um in a you know in a in a way that's um meaningful 
uh, another delusion that the modernists pinched from the Gothic revivalists was the idea of development, that things come and they flower and they go. It's not true. Things go on. I would say Gothic is very much alive. So my answer is not that different to Emily's, actually, which is to say it should be Gothic. It doesn't have to be that Gothic, uh, just as that Gothic of Viola de Duke wasn't the same as the medieval Gothic. I, I wouldn't disagree with anything um, my, my colleagues have, uh, have said. I think, I think, though, one's got to be to look at how one can adapt and change and be creative in one's thinking and continue to challenge. I think the joys of these buildings is that they don't represent one particular... They are a multitude of different things, and I think that's the, the, the beauty of them. When I was at, very quickly, I would say, when I worked for St. Paul's, I found it very strange because having had a period, particularly earlier in, at Canterbury and then going for two years at St. Paul's, I found St. Paul's strangely modern um, in a weird sort of way. And because it was one person's vision, as in Wren, it felt different. Um, the joy of these places are what they call, you know, those layers of dust and the fact that, you know, you don't know what's around the corner and it, 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 it tells you its own story. So for me, it's about retaining the spirit of Notre Dame, but its ability to tell its story. And that story continues as well. These things are not about putting them into aspic and protecting them. It's a, it's a story that continues.